Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is 12 o'clock on a Sunday, which means it's time for a Q&A. Now, this is where I take all the questions that uh, you've asked over the course of the week, and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, now, if uh, you haven't seen the Q&A before, the idea is that I'm very spontaneous with the questions. So, in other words, um, I don't read them beforehand. I look at them, and I try and give you an answer there and then on the spot. And if I think it's deserving of a, a longer video, I'll do a separate video on it. Uh, also, if I haven't answered your question, I'm very, very sorry. Um, sometimes I'll record it early, and if you've asked the question after I've recorded it, then I'll miss it, in which case, just ask it down below and I'll get back to it again next week. Um, the other thing is, uh, my brain's a bit fogged at the moment. I'm uh, currently filming this on the Tuesday, and I'm in the middle of a course of antibiotics. Um, uh, because I've got uh, an infection, uh, uh, cellulitis, which is quite serious. And uh, I'm in a bit of pain, but I didn't want to not do the Q&A. Uh, but one of the things it does is it causes my brain to fog a little bit. So if the answers aren't as um, in-depth as normal, that's why. And I apologise. And if you want more clarification, ask me next week when I've got better. Anyway, with that being said, I've had a quick look. There are lots of questions. So we're going to get straight into it with this week's Q&A. So the first question here is from David W. And David W. says, Hi, Craig. Hope you're well. My question is on time management. Do you have any tips on managing time effectively in order to complete goals without burnout? I have a full-time job also trying to make a career out of performing magic in the evenings as well as creating my own solo show. It's really tricky to balance all of these things as well as holding down a relationship, socialising with friends and family. As someone who does many things as you do, how do you prioritise what you need to do? Um, good question. So first of all, it, the first thing I'd say is don't put too much pressure on yourself. I do do a lot of stuff, but I prioritise things as well. So for example, I'm not very well this week. And uh, the number one priority is health. Because if I get really seriously ill, um, I'm my business, my relationship, my family is screwed. So uh, when I'm uh, ill, for example, I'll take a step back. You know, that's something that I have to do. I'll, I'll get better. And you'll see less content going out or I haven't had anything to do with any of the other companies. So first of all, prioritize stuff because there's a lot you're doing there. You've got to write a one man show. You got to, you, you're trying to make a career out of performing magic. It looks like you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself. Remember, you have a full time job. And this is the problem that a lot of people have when they want to transition into being a magician full time and make a career out of it. They try to run before they can walk. This is a great, you can look at any situation or any, anything. You can look at it in a negative way or you can look at it in a, uh, a positive way. And the negative way of looking at this is I've got a full time job and I don't particularly like my full time job. I'd rather be doing magic full time. It's holding me back. Oh my gosh, I want to do this quicker. Or you can look at it and go, well, you know what? I'm very lucky because I've got a full-time job, so I've got a full-time income coming in, which means I don't need to go and get gigs. So I can build my business and the marketing and the branding and the digital footprint. I can build all of that while I've got that full-time job. One of the busiest and the most successful working professional magicians in the UK is a guy called Owen Strickland. And Owen Strickland um, you know, for many, many years before he went full-time, he had a, a really intense full-time job and he worked alongside that. And it only got to a point that he went full-time with the magic when he was getting so much work, it was kind of getting in the way. So don't put too much pressure on yourself. You know, you're saying you're trying to make a career out of performing magic. Break it down. Break it step by step. Have you got the website? Yes. Okay. Is the website optimised? Yes. Are you putting a blog in place? Yeah, I don't know the answers to these questions, but don't, it, it, don't try and do everything all at once because what will happen is you'll end up doing either nothing at all because you'll be overwhelmed or you'll end up doing a lot of stuff really badly. So the best thing to do is just to pick one thing and get good at it. So you talked about um, creating your own one-man show. Is that the most important thing to you, David? If it is the most important thing to you, then focus on that first of all. Because you've got all the time in the world. You've got this full-time income. So you've got all the time in the world. So if that's the most important thing for you, focus on creating the solo show. Focus on creating the routines. Focus on and put yourself a goal in place. 
Having a goal, or as my friend Cross says, having a clear mental image is really important. Because if you have a goal, or you have a clear mental image, you know where you're going to be. It's a little bit like being the captain of a ship that's going round and round in circles because it has no destination. If you're you know, piloting a ship and you don't know where you're going, you are going to go round and round in circles. But if you know the destination, if you know where you're going to go, then you have somewhere to aim for. And it's the same with, with what you're doing right here you know, pick the solo show first of all, because to be honest, if you've got a solo show, that will catapult you from a career point of view ahead of a lot of people, because a lot of people that go and do full-time magic, they've just got close-up. They don't have a show. They go and do close-up and that's it. And if they had a phone call saying, could you do a show? They wouldn't know where to start. So get that solo show put in place first of all, but set yourself a date, right? In six months time, I'm going to have this solo show written and done and book yourself a venue, book, book, book yourself a venue, like a little theater, they're not very expensive. Book yourself a little theatre and, and put the show on there and say, right, I'm going to have this in six months time. I'm going to have this show and I'm going to uh, have this venue and I'm going to advertise it. And now you're putting pressure on yourself and now you can focus just on that. And that's going to help you with a career point of view because you can get a camera crew there to that close up uh, to that uh, solo show and you can get a bunch of footage. You can get talking heads from people as they leave the theater. So now all of those digital assets are going to now help when it comes to building up your career as a magician. But yeah, the biggest piece of advice I can give you when it comes to time management is just focus on one thing at a time. Now, it's not always possible, but look into something called a priority matrix, okay? That's that's another big tip that I can give you. Look into something called a priority matrix. Um, <clears throat> it's easier to Google it, but very quickly, take a piece of paper and put a big cross on the piece of paper. So you've got four quadrants. Now, along the left-hand side, that's the vertical axis, you're going to write uh, importance. So you're going to write importance. And then along the uh, horizontal axis, you're going to write urgency. So you're going to have four quadrants, urgency and uh, importance. So the top left quadrant is the thing that's most important and most urgent. That's the stuff that you have to do now. And it's really important for the success and the longevity of your business. That's what you do first of all. OK, then you've got stuff that's not important, um, uh, but uh, oh, let's go the other way. Then you've got stuff that's important but not urgent. Yeah, it's, it, you've got stuff that's important that's not urgent. Now, that might be, for example, uh, SEO, because that's important. It's really important to improve the SEO of your website, but it's not urgent. If you don't do it tomorrow, it's not a big problem, right? It could be writing brand new emails for your email marketing strategy. That's important, but it's not urgent. So what you do is you do that after the urgent stuff that's important, okay? Then you've got the stuff that's not important, uh, but urgent. And this is the stuff that's a total, complete and utter time waster. The stuff that's not important, but it's urgent. This is the stuff that can really take all of your time. Um, and, and what you want to do is you either want to, well, delegate or bid it. You know, you want to delegate that to somebody else. And that's a topic for another conversation. Or you want to bid it. And then you've got the stuff that's not important and not urgent. And that stuff you just want to get rid of completely. So have a look into the priority matrix. That will help you understand that you can only do certain amount of things. So take one goal at a time and don't beat yourself up. Look at your situation in a positive way, not a negative way. You're in a great situation. You've got a full time income coming in. You've got that foundation there. So now you can build on that. And before you know it, you're going to be a full time pro. You're going to build a career in magic and uh, it'll happen as long as you don't beat yourself up. Okay, so the next question is from Curtis Wines, and Curtis says, Hey Craig, question asked, this with respect to you and your crew as performers, but I have to wonder, in the matchumentary in the final illusion show, you did like three or four illusions in a row, along the line of person goes in box, sharp object goes through box, sharp object taken out, person comes out totally fine. Why do you have all these tricks in the show, which to me feel very similar? There was a lot of stuff going on in that show. I wasn't even meant to do any of the illusions. Matt was meant to do all the illusions in the show. And just before the show started, he was freaking out. And I said, look, I'll jump in. But I wasn't even prepared to do it. I hadn't even planned the illusion show segments. So I wasn't really prepared to do it. That was the one problem. I jumped in and helped him because I wanted him to focus on his cabaret show. And I said, look, I tell you, what, I'll do the illusions with you. The second problem is, as the show went on, we had timing issues. People were overrunning and we had the theatre for a certain amount of time. And as the show went on, it was very obvious to me that we were going to have to overrun. So that second illusion show, I was pulling 
pulling, there were meant to be three. I was pulling illusions out. I was saying like, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. And I was literally changing stuff up on the fly in order to try and crawl back some time. Ryland, was, uh, Ryland went over, Matt went over, everybody went over. Um, so I was, there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes and I was basically managing everything and I was trying to bring it in on time because I knew the theatre wasn't going to be very happy if we're over time. And to be honest, you're probably right uh, in terms of the content of that second thing were very similar. That wasn't going to be the case. But realistically, I had no choice in order to get everything in. Um, and that's the thing sometimes when you're performing magic. Um, it's, the, don't be afraid to change things around if you have to. The audience doesn't know what's going to happen. And it's more important that you're professional. And one of the things about being professional is coming in on time. So I was running around like a blue ass fly backstage, trying to make sure everything was coming in correctly. I shortened the uh, the break. I shortened the um, what the the the, the, um, the intermission uh, to try and crawl back some more time. And uh, you know that was just the sort of thing that we had to do back there. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, if you've ever planned a live event, you know that a lot of things go wrong, and you just kind of have to adapt to it as it goes. Okay, so the next one is Jonah Berg, and Jonah Berg says, what are the best mentalism books out there? Um, uh, to be honest, I'd say Michael Murray's, uh, Re Michael, Mur what's the, uh, the Michael Murray book? Uh, I can't remember, but Michael Murray's book is one of the best. Can't remember the name of it, uh, but he's just had it reprinted. I know he has. Uh, a Piece of My Mind, that's it, A Piece of My Mind by Michael Murray, which is available for Mind FX, is incredible. Luch's book, which I'm not going to spend too much time talking about because it's now out of print, is great. Phil Smith's book, if you haven't checked out any of Phil Smith's material, he's amazing. Phil Smith's book is awesome. Uh, anything by Pete Turner is great. Um, he brought a book out recently, what was it? Uh, I can't remember, but there was a new book that came out by Pete Turner uh, recently, which was incredible. The Colour Series by Max Maven is also a great series of mentalism books. And, you know, don't overlook or underlook or whatever you're going to call it, the 13 Steps to Mentalism. Uh, Corinda's, is it Corinda? Uh, 13 Steps to Mentalism is just an exceptional, exceptional book. Uh, it's a little bit old now, but it's a little bit like, you know, Bobo's. It may be old, but there's still some great information in there. Um, there's probably a million books that I've missed. And to all those people who I've missed, I very much apologize. But those are the ones that spring instantly to mind. Okay, ironically, the next question is by Jonah Berg, and it's about peace of the mind. Do you have Michael Murray's book, Peace of My Mind? And if so, what do you think? Yes, I have. It's brilliant. I'm planning on doing a review on it now. It's been reprinted soon. Uh, it's one of the best mentalism books ever written. Uh, it's incredible. It's really good. Uh, I was speaking to my friend Nemed Phoenix. He's had it for years and he watched my interview with Michael Murray and off the back of the interview, he was like, right, I'm going to reread this book. And he's already got like two routines out of it and he's already 20 pages in. It's a brilliant book. You will get multiple routines out of it that you will be able to put into your repertoire. It's really good. Okay, so the next question is by OM Magic UK. And OM Magic UK says, What's the best wallet for card in wallet? I've tried a few and the loads always seem tight. Thanks. Um, yeah, some of them do have a very tight load. That's what she said. Um, however, I, if, you, if you're worried about the load being tight, then I'd look at the JOL range by Prop Dog uh, because those, those loads were designed to be really loose. Um, and uh, very, very easy to go in. The problem with the JOL range is they look a little bit outdated now compared to the more modern sleek wallets, but uh, JOL is, is great for that. I, I love the Orphic wallet. Uh, it took me a little time to get used to the Orphic wallet, <clears throat> but uh, I got used to it and now I use it at every gig. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and if you're worried about the load being tight on a palmed card, the other options are not to use a palmed card. Like a lot of people don't use this, but the uh, uh, the uh, is it the Mullica wallet is fantastic. You know the Mullica principle, where you're actually stealing the card from the top of the deck, and you show the wallet, and you show the wallet inside the wallet, and then you load it in as you open it up. That's great, and you don't even need to palm a card, so there's no problem there. There's a lot of no palm card to wallets that will completely do away with the fact that the load might or might not be tight. Um, so yeah, there's always that. And you know, a little tip, that, a little trick that I used to do when I was younger, 
don't do it anymore. Uh, but I always used to struggle to load a palmed card into a wallet when I was younger. And how I got around it is I would use a long card because I always found that the difficulty was the wallet lay down in my pocket, whether it was the back pocket or the jacket pocket, the wallet always laid down and it was very difficult for me to get it in. And I just learned to deal with that over time. But for many, many years when I was working restaurants, I would take a long card. You know that one that's like a long card and it's got three of hearts, eight of hearts and and the idea is you pull it out and you go, was your card a three or a four or a five? I'd put that into the wallet. And that would act as a really long guide because it would stick up above my pocket. And I would have one person pick a card and the other person I would force, using a classic force so it looked the same, I'd force the eight, uh, the eight of hearts. And then what I'd do is I'd control the card to the top of the deck, the first, the first person's card. I'd say, you sign yours. I've only got one pen. Don't worry about signing yours. You put yours back in the deck. And I'd have them shuffle the deck because I don't need to control theirs. And the other person's card, I'd control to the top of the side still and I'd palm it out. And I'd say, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make your card jump into my pocket. And I'd reach into the pocket with the palmed card, load the palmed card into the wallet via the long card, which is acting as a slide. And then I'd pull the long card out for the gag, which Lee takes the slide out the wallet. And I'd go, was your card a three of hearts? No. What about a four? Five, six, seven, eight. It was the eight of hearts. Brilliant. So it's a nice revelation because the long card is super fun. But it made it loading into the wallet a lot easier. And then I could take out the wallet and I could say, well, look, let me see if I can, uh, I can try it with your card. And I'd just take the wallet out. And I'd say, look, there's nothing inside the wallet. Look, I'm going to make it go into the pocket. Oh, it's not there. Oh, hang on, look, the wallet was in the pocket. I wonder if something happened and then you open it and it's in there. So uh, maybe if you're struggling, look at a long card. That might be a way to go. But uh, yeah, there's a few different options. Hope it helps. Okay, so the next question is from Johnny Coates. And Johnny says, hey, Craig, love the show. I'm visiting London for a few days in March. Any recommendations for places to go magic related? Is it easy enough to get over to Alakazam and Ashford? I, like you, am on public transport. Um, so yeah, it's fairly easy to get to Alakazam. You go to, I think it's Waterloo. I'm pretty sure it's Waterloo. Might be wrong. Uh, either that or King's Cross. I can't remember, but there's a super fast train to Ashford, which is where Alakazam is. And by super fast, I mean, it's like 30 minutes. So you can get on the train and they run very, very regularly. So you can get on the train 30 minutes later you're in Ashford. There's taxis outside. A five pound taxi will take you to, uh, to Alakazam. So you can be at Alakazam in like three quarters of an hour. Absolutely not a problem. And if you go there and you need lunch, go to Rockies. That's what everyone does. Um, but yeah, so Alakazam is one of the places that you should go. I'd also recommend going to Hamlet's because, you know, you've got some of the best magic demonstrators from Marvin's Magic ever working in Hamlet's. It's a really cool place to go so i definitely recommend going to Hamley's if you've got time uh one place you should absolutely go is is to Covent Garden because in Covent Garden there's this place called Magic Corner where you've got a plethora of street magicians doing their acts uh Nathan Earl is a regular there he's my favorite but there's a bunch of people that are really good and they do shows almost regularly throughout the day so it's worth going to uh, uh to there and also while you're there if you go around the corner, there's a um, uh, kind of a stall in the market and it's called the Magic Cave and it sells magic tricks and uh, it's worth checking out. It's not the greatest magic shop by any stretch of the imagination, but it's worth going there. It used to be owned by Lee Hathaway. So there you go. That's an interesting piece of trivia. And if you then cross the road and you go into the indoor market, Ryland would tell you immediately, I can't remember the name of the place, but just on the left hand side, uh, there's a puzzles and... Uh, playing card shop and when Ryland goes to London he always buys a new cube from there he always buys a new pack of cards from there and they've got really nice cards all of the latest cards really cheap and all of the cool Rubik's cubes there it doesn't do magic but it does do a lot of cards a lot of, lot of custom decks so that's worth going to if you go to Covent Garden uh, outside of that, where else is worth going? Well, it's, you know, if you can get an invite from one of the members of the Magic Circle, it's worth going to the Magic Circle on a Monday night. Uh, if you do go to the Magic Circle on a Monday night, which is members' night, you're going to be able to um, 
uh, go check out the museum down below and see all of the really cool stuff in the museum. You're going to be able to catch a lecture. You need to be signed in by somebody you know. So if you know a Magic Circle member that's going to be going on and they're going to be there on a Monday, it's worth going to the Magic Circle. And then finally, go to International Magic on Clerkenwell Drive. Uh, you can get there on the Tube and it's about a seven minute walk away from the Tube Station, seven or eight minute walk. And that's a really cool magic shop. You can spend hours in there. They've got a lot of back catalogue of uh, old DVDs from when they used to run the Macmillan's Day, uh, Ron's Day, um, which ran for a very, very long time. That's worth checking out. There's some real golden nuggets in there, some great books and tricks. It's worth going to International. Unfortunately, places like Davenport have closed down now, but um, there's still a lot of places to go and see and do in London. So, uh, oh, Prop Dog, of course. Prop Dog's there. Uh, it'll still be there in March. It, its stock is dwindling down because they're you know, they're quietly shutting their doors, but it is still open at the moment. So um, you can go over to Prop Dog and you can go check out the stuff in Prop Dog. Alex is always there and he's super, super nice. And if you're lucky, you might see Mike Sullivan. And uh, even though their stock is dwindling because they're moving to Wales, uh, they're not moving for a while and they've still got a load of stuff in there. They've got a lot of hidden gems. So have a look at that as well. That pretty much sums it up. I think those are all the different places to go to London. Have fun. It's an amazing place and you'll have a blast. Okay, so the next question is from David Faze. And David says, question for next week. Hi, Craig. Cheers on the uh, congratulations on the creator of the year, my friend. Absolutely well deserved. Thank you. I've been running into this situation more and more lately where I'm doing an amazing card trick, but the person doesn't even remember their own card. I've noticed it happens a lot more with younger generations as they barely even play games with playing cards as everything they do is online now. Uh, and so they rarely handle playing cards. A lot of the time they don't even know the difference between a club and a spade. What do you do in situations like these? Is there a way to ensure that the person remembers their card or ensure that the person even knows the name of the card that they're looking at? Nothing is more frustrating than asking someone what their card was at the end of the trick and they have no idea or worse, they say the king of clubs when it's actually a king of spades. Your wisdom on this subject would be much appreciated. Thank you. So yeah, it's a great question. It's something that can happen. My advice would make it an interactive performance. You're never going to be performing one-on-one -on -one, or it might occasionally be performing one-on-one, -on -one, but it's unlikely. Um, so uh, because there's going to be a whole bunch of people there normally, have them show it to everybody. Say, uh, do me a favor, pick a card, any card, fantastic. Look at it, show it everybody. Guys, I want you to remember this card because it's really important. Later on, I'm going to show you something amazing. It is really important you remember the card. And more importantly, I want you to remember the name, and uh, the, 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 like whether it's a seven or a 10 or a jack. And I also want you to remember the, uh, the suit of the card as well. So I want you to remember the value and the suit. Can you do that for me? Would that be okay? Fantastic. And by getting a whole bunch of people involved with that, even if the target forgets the card, it's totally not a problem because somebody else will chime in and go, oh no, that was the card. So that's the first option. The second option is, if you're worried that somebody might not know what the card is in terms of value or suit, you can use that same presentational approach. So if you're doing it to just one person, <clears throat> or you don't want to get everyone to look at it, you could say, hey, now do you, I want you to remember two parts of this card. I want you to remember the value. That's whether it's an ace, a two, a three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or one of the picture cards, a jack, queen, or a king. Do you know what the value of the card is? You do. Brilliant. The next thing I want you to do is remember the, the suit. So whether it's a club, that's the black ones with the puffy feet, the hearts, the spades, look like the spade, or a diamond. Have you got the suit of the card as well? You have. Brilliant. And you've kind of laboured that point but now you know for sure that they, because if they didn't know the suit, for example, they'd go, I don't know the difference between clubs and spades, at which point you could go, oh, show somebody else. Or you could take two cards out of the deck and say, well, this is a club. This is a spade. You got it. Brilliant. Now, the third option is everybody carries a phone around with them now. So the third and final option is you could say, hey, it's really important that you remember the card. Now, the problem is I've done this a few times and I've had people actually forget the card and it kills the trip because at the end, when I dramatically say this is your card, if you go, I don't know, it kind of loses its impact slightly. So do me a favor, take your phone and take a picture of that card. That way later on, we'll know if it was definitely your card or not. Have you got the picture? You have? Brilliant. Right, let's carry on. And now, you know, everyone carries a phone around with them. They're used to taking pictures. I read somewhere on the internet that there's more pictures that have been taken in the last 12 months than there have been in the entire history of film itself. And I'm really not surprised with the, uh, you know, with how popular 
uh, places like Instagram and Facebook and social media are. I'm not surprised. But the result of that is everybody carries a phone around with them. Everybody knows how to take a picture in a matter of seconds. So having them just snap a picture of the card is totally a non-issue, but it solves all of the problems that you've actually laid out there. So those are the three different ways I'd do that. Hopefully that helps. Okay, so the next question is from Nick Adcock. And Nick says, are you doing any stage gigs this year? And the answer is very simply, yes, I'm doing a ton of them. But most of them are privates or they're weddings or they're corporates or stuff like that. However, if you want to see me perform, whenever Ryland's at the House of Secrets, I always do a 10 or a 15 minute spot at the beginning to warm up the crowd. Uh, before he comes on at the first half and I normally do a 10 minute spot at the f beginning of the second half so I normally do about 25 minutes on stage at the House of Secrets. Now Ryland's website actually has where you can see me because he does do <coughs> excuse me a lot of ticketed events so if there's somewhere that you want to if you want to see me in action Ryland's never going to be appearing at the House of Secrets without me. He's never going to be appearing anywhere without me. So if he's got a date in his diary of somewhere he's performing, I'm going to be there. So, um, you know, it's, it's worthwhile checking that out. Uh, we are doing the Hocus Pocus show for the Bradford Magic Circle. So uh, that's going to be interesting. And I'll tell you for why in a second. And this is only just being confirmed. So let's just Hocus Pocus. Uh, Hocus Pocus magic hopefully they've started advertising it yet pocus pocus magic show uh bradford it's organized by the bradford magic circle i think or the bradford magic society really nice guys um bradford magic society let's have a look it's the hey presto show not the uh it's the hey presto show i'm an idiot i'm very sorry what's on can we see this um no they've not really updated their website okay that's not a problem uh, maybe they haven't, I can't see it. It's the Hey Presto Show. It is absolutely, 100%, definitely, the Hey Presto Show. And it doesn't have any information on there at all, which is fantastic. Um, so, I'm trying to find... Nope, doesn't have anything on there. Uh, it's the Hey Presto Show. It's taking place at the end of March. Uh, so it's taking place at the uh, the end of April. So it's taking place at the end of April. I think it's the last Friday or Saturday in April. And what's interesting about that is I'm doing an illusion show. And I never do an illusion show for magicians. Uh, just because I like to keep that for myself, just for lay people. But somehow they talk me into it. So I'm doing a, an illusion show for magicians. Uh, or there's going to be laymen and magicians in the audience. But Ryland's going to be with me. So we're going to do the whole second half. And I'm going to be doing illusions on Ryland. I'm bringing Matt as well, I think. I don't know, but I'm thinking about bringing Matt to get to do some of his stuff. Ryland's going to be doing all of his bigger material as well, the dancing cane and everything. We're going to go all out. So if you want to see that, that's going to be at the end of April. Beyond that, if you want to see any shows with me in, uh, it's best to just check out Ryland's website, which is rylandpetty.com. Okay, so the next question is from the un, un, the unswattable midge. Hello, the unswattable midge. Hello, Craig. Hi, unswattable bitch. How do you ask an obviously very busy man if he's finished his video on the hows and whys of the thumb tip video? I've almost finished it, and then Blackpool happened, and then secret filming happened, and then illness happened, and uh, and now I'm not 100%, to be honest. I'll, I'll hopefully get it done. I, my plan was to get it done by this week. That's not going to happen. It's probably going to be in the next couple of weeks now. Um, I'm just trying to get better from this infection. I've got quite a serious infection, but um, uh, and so I'm limiting the amount of videos that I'm doing, unfortunately, and that's a big one. But in the next week or two, I'd say definitely by the end of March, it'll be done. Okay, so the next question is from Jackson Pol Bollock, and Jackson Bollock says, my question is, when can we expect a video on bullying in the magic industry that you mentioned was coming? Uh, it's a really important issue, and if anyone can bring an end to it, it's you, Craig. Yeah, again, that's coming. I've actually... Um, I've actually, I'm in the process of hiring a um, private detective because I want to make sure that all of my information is 100% accurate and correct. And I want to make it very factual with no uh, opinions at all. I just want to make it very factual as to what's been happening. And please don't rush me on this because I want to make sure that I've got all of my information correct. It'll definitely be coming. It's definitely in the next month or two. Um, but I'm cataloging information at the moment. But you are right. It is very important. And it is coming. Okay, so the next question is from J J who? Job Time. Job Time. 
Uh, Job Time says, hi, do you have, uh, do you or does someone know when Henry Harris is bringing the 7x7 trick on the market? Thanks already. It's called Cube Buster. Uh, he released it at Blackpool. I know there's a trailer there. I know there's a tutorial there. I know the product is there and I know the packaging is done. Um, I imagine it will be coming out relatively soon. Uh, Ryland's already put it in his show. We can't wait to review it. I love it. Ryland loves it. We're both performing it. It's amazing. In terms of when it's coming out, I would imagine very, very soon. Um, but a lot of Henry's stuff doesn't go into Murphy's. So the best thing to do is to watch Henry's website, sign up to his email address uh, and his mailing list. And as soon as it's available, he'll mail you out and you'll know about it. Okay, so the next question is from Eviata Barzalay. I think I've butchered that again, buddy. I'm sorry. <laughs> he says, hi, firstly, I had to laugh at you trying to pronounce my name, but don't feel bad. It's a hard name. Even Lloyd pronounced it wrong. Lloyd's stupid. He'll pronounce everything wrong. Um, <laughs> what version of Cards Across do you recommend without any sleight of hand? Uh, and how can you advertise yourself? Thanks for the help. Right. OK, so any without any sleight of hand. Depends on if you're perform performing on stage or if you're performing close up. If you're performing on stage, I would say Superfly by Scott Alexander. Now, you'll see a video of me doing Superfly, but I've varied the handling. I've changed the handling up so that I've palmed the cards just because I preferred a more direct approach. But the way that Scott teaches it in the original Superfly, there is no palming at all. You take two envelopes out, you have a pack of cards, you have someone an envelope, they examine it, they take 10 cards, they put them in, you do the same with the second envelope, and then the cards jump across. That's as self-working as you're going to get for a cards across on stage. In terms of close-up, I might be a little bit biased, but I've got two really good close-up uh, cards across, both of which are on the Netrix. Um, now, the first one is called the Invisible Cards Across. It was originally on my Invisible uh, deck project called Visible from the 1914. Then I put it on my Penguin Live. It's also on the Netflix because so many people asked for it. Um, it's a way of doing uh, Cards Across with no palming at all, no moves, no nothing. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's, I'm really happy with how that came out, and it's something I do a lot. Uh, and I, I did it in my lectures for years and years. Uh, the second uh, version was recently put on the Netflix, and it's my version of um, Las Vegas Leaper by Paul Harris. But I've eliminated any palming. If you know the original Las Vegas Leaper, you're having to steal cards back, you're having to do false counts, you're having to do um, um, rubberway vanishes or tent vanishes and so on and so forth. This eliminates all of that. So you literally hand 10 cards to one person, 10 cards to another person, they hold on to them and the three cards jump from one place to another. Again, no sleight of hand, no palming. So those are three different versions that you could go for. Two of them are on the Netflix. One of them is not, uh, but you can get it. It's called Superfly. Okay, we've got one more question from Aviata Barzlag. <laughs> Sorry. And it's, how can I advertise myself? Well, that's a very broad question. How can you advertise yourself? Well, I mean, I, I, it's too broad a question to answer right here. But what I would say, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is to develop a brand, develop a digital footprint online so that when people are looking and, and try to localize it as much as possible, at least initially. Uh, you know, I meet so many magicians that try to get to page one on Google uh, for the whole of the UK, whilst in reality, that's a difficult thing to do. But to be the best magician in your town that appears at the top when you search for it, that's a lot easier. Um, and, and so focus on building that brand in your local area. My friend Tom Mullinger dominates Coventry and he dominated Coventry by just being the best and just focusing on dominating Coventry. Um, so pick an area and just focus on that initially. And, and what you should do is you should try to look for as many ways as possible to get your name out there for free. Attend free networking events to tell people who you are and what you do. Arrange to have meetings with local venues to tell them who you are and what you do and show them why you can, uh, uh, why you're the best magician in your area. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you can, you can uh, grow your brand for free. Go and register on various different uh, sort of business uh, websites where they list businesses. It's not going to do much for you. Don't do a paid one. Do it for free. But those backlinks are going to help. You're going to be everywhere. 
just just really focus uh, on on building up your digital footprint and that could be through blogs on your website it could be through content marketing it could be through um, uh, social media it could be Instagram it could be Facebook but really focus on that side of things and dominate one area when you've dominated that area you can move outwards uh, there's a lot more on the neat on the metrics on the silver level but hopefully that'll get you started okay so the next question was hey Craig it's by the kitchen magician by the way and he says hey Craig how are you doing kitchen magician what was your first magic trick uh, you ever learned if you can remember and what was Ryland's first magic trick well the first magic trick I ever learned they all like blurred into one because I was at Butlins and I went to the um, the local market and I saw a magician selling tricks and over the course of two or three days I bought everything he had and he only had like five tricks and I bought all of them I can't remember which one was first I've said various different things uh, but there was a Svengali deck there was a dynamic coins. There was a, uh, a sort of a blank deck, a little bit like a nudist deck. There was a tapered deck. They called it tapered deck, which is obviously a stripper deck. There was the magic spot paddles. And there was a haunted deck. That's, that's what was there. And I bought all of them over a two or three day period. I think that the first one that I actually mastered and started doing really well with was the spot paddles, but I'm not too sure. It might not be. Could have been the Svengali deck. But those were the first bunch of tricks that I bought from this same market store while I was red coat at Butlins. Um, and then your other part to this question is, what was Ryland's first magic trick? Well, the first thing I ever taught Ryland to do was how to vanish a coin. So I actually taught him how to make a coin disappear, and that was at the age of two. So if you've watched his stage show, which we put up on Magic TV, when he goes into the coin routine, where he makes the coin vanish and jump into the bucket one at a time, um, he says at the beginning of that, I've been doing magic since the age of two, and the first trick I learned was how to make a coin disappear and appear somewhere else. That's really true. We really focused on sleight of hand with Ryland. I don't know if that's necessarily the best way to go, but it's the way I went. So after learning the, uh, the coin vanish... Um, we then did sponge ball vanish. This was still at the age of two. Then he did the sponge ball routine. And then we did coins across. And I think then we moved on to linking rings. So there was a lot of sleight of hand based magic right at the very, very beginning for Ryland. But definitely the first trick he learned was making a coin disappear. Okay, so the next trick once again, uh, the next question once again is from the kitchen magician. And he says, if you had only one coin in your pocket and you had to perform a coin trick, what coin trick would you perform? Cheers, Kitchen Magician. Well, I would, honestly, do a coin flurry because there's an awful lot you can do with a coin flurry. Uh, if I can get a coin out of my pocket, I can show that I can make a coin appear. I can vanish it. I can then uh, take that dust and put it back into my hand and squeeze it and turn it back into a coin. I can make the coin jump from here to here. I can make it jump from here to here. I can make it jump from here to here. I can do all of this fancy stuff. And people love this. I know a lot of people don't like... Uh, flurries but uh i love flurries i really do and uh i i incorporate a lot of other stuff with it as well so i do a really nice uh, uh one coin goes through the hand and you say oh look i'll do that again the coin goes right through the hand you're probably wondering how that works well i push it it goes halfway and then it goes the rest of the way that's how it works uh if you if you keep your hand this way up you can actually make it jump up through the uh the back of the hand, which kind of looks a little bit weird. Uh, all of that's with one coin. Coin on shoulder is great with one coin. Uh, if you've seen the thing that I do in the videos, which isn't mine, first person I saw do it, I think it was James Brown, where you do this and you load it onto the back of their hands when their hands are like that, that's amazing. Um, there's so much you can do with one coin. So I think if I was going to, uh, oh, and, and easily with one coin, you can do coin under watch. Ask them to hold the hand out, load the coin under the watch, watch. There you go. Have a look under your watch. You know, there's so much you can do with one coin. So I would say if I was going to be doing magic with one coin, it would be a flurry. And I think more people should do a flurry because I think it's a really magical sequence that not a lot of people do. OK, so the next question is from Seth Howard. And Seth says, will the stage tricks on the net tricks be available to the bronze level? Yes, they will. Um, yes, they will indeed. You were a silver level subscriber for a good while. Um, but you had to take a break, but you're going to come back as a bronze. It's great. Yeah, they'll be available as a bronze level. I'm, I'm organizing all of the stuff for uh, <coughs> the stage material now. We're going to have its own little section. Um, I'm going to be teaching my YMCA routine, my cards across. I'm going to be teaching a whole bunch of different stuff. So there's going to be a load of material 
going up on stage magic. You know, we, we had a multi-year plan with the Netrix and this is the next evolution. Well, actually the next evolution I'm announcing in the next few days and it's going to be amazing. But part of the evolution is, uh, is a stage magic section. So yeah, it's definitely going to be dropping in March. It's going to be very exciting. Look out for it. Okay, so the next question is from Seth Howard. And Seth says, when first building up your business, would you say it's better to dip your toes in every market to find a good fit? Or do you deep dive into a specific market and hope for the best? Really, it's down to the individual. Um, and I know that's a bit of a cop-out, but it's down to the individual. Um, the problem with uh, dipping your toes into every market is you can f take your focus away from the other stuff that you're doing. Now, the perfect example here is Magic TV. I have gone so deep and so hard on Magic TV that I've taken my focus off Nonstop Kids and Slightly Unusual and all my other companies. Now, it's not too much of a problem for me because I have a team of people that are still running that and those companies are doing better than they've ever done before. However, if I didn't have that team of people in place, that would not be the case. I would be focusing on this and it would be taking a lot of everything away from everything else that I did and that's the problem when you it's a little bit like plate spinning right you spin a plate and that's fine then you spin a second plate brilliant now you're spinning a third plate and you look over and the first plate's gone so now you have to stop giving all the attention over to these two plates and you have to go back to the first plate because you have to let that go in again and then the second plate's going so now you have to go back to the second plate now the third plate's going then you go right I'm going to do a fourth plate but now all three of those other plates aren't working anymore and it's a little bit like plate spinning, looking at different areas, because you can't just say, I'm going to go into every market, because what's going to happen is if you don't put 100% in, you're just going to half arse it. And if you can half arse it, it's never going to be as good as you want it to be. So using that plate spinning analogy here, you start by doing kids magic, right? OK, or uh, I don't know what you mean by every market, but let's just assume you mean kids market, corporates, weddings, close up, whatever. So you start doing uh, you start doing kids shows and you put all your focus into getting the best kids show that you can. And it's awesome. You go, brilliant. I've got that working right now. I'm going to start doing weddings. So you start doing weddings as a close up magician and you put all your focus into there. You can see that this plate is starting to go a little bit, but it's fine because you need to put your efforts here and you go, brilliant. OK, they're both doing OK. That's not doing as well as it was, but it's still working. That's doing great, right? And now I'm going to work on corporate. You start working on corporate and now the bottom's full. Your, your business with your kid's market is going to crash in a second. So you go, oh my God, you haven't been able to get that spinning properly, but you've got to go back to sort the kid's stuff out. So you sort that out and you go, right, okay, that's back to where I want it to be. Now, oh my God, now, now the wedding thing's going, oh my, now the corporate, and it's a little bit like that. So you really want to focus um, on one particular area, generally as a rule. Pick the area that you like the best and really focus on that area. Uh, and then when you've dominated it and you know it inside out and back to front and you've got a brand built up and it's kind of almost running itself, then you can pick another area and you can focus and put all you focus on that area. And I would suggest hiring a virtual PA or a member of staff that can work on the business that's already established. Once you've set up the systems and procedures, you can get a virtual PA to come in. You can teach them how to run that aspect of the business. They can run that while you're focusing on that. So even if that plate starts to go, they're the ones spinning the plate for you. So you're not going to have the same issue that I mentioned before which is what I'm doing with Magic TV. If I, at the moment, I've got a series of six or seven plates and I'm just over here with Magic TV and the Netflix and I'm just spinning this thing like crazy. And now if I didn't have other people with me, these plates would have smashed ages ago. But I've got, I've got, uh, you know, I've got, I've got, I've got Liz and Reagan over there that are, that are spinning this plate. I've got Kay and I've got Matt that are spinning this place. I've got Michael. I've got Jack that's spinning this place. I've got Becky that's spinning this place. I've got all these different people spinning the plates. And I've got Sarah walking back and forth, making sure everyone's spinning correctly, which means I can focus where I want to focus, right? If you don't have those resources in place, it's best to really just focus on one particular uh, market. Make that the best it can be and then move on. Scotland's Magic Sensation says, Hey Craig, you're answering more and more questions each week and the videos get longer. Eventually the Q&As will have to be over two nights like WrestleMania. I'm beginning to think that, mate. Anyway, my question is, how do you get really good and really smooth at sleight of hand like Michael Vincent or Danny Goldsmith? Or is it literally just constant practice? Thanks. Um, yeah, <laughs> I imagine. Um, I mean, I, here's the thing. I'm, I, I'm better with coins than with cards. I'm good with cards, don't get me wrong. 
but I'm not the best by any stretch of the imagination. Absolutely not. It was only six months ago that I learned how to do a strike double. Before that, I was lifting up the back, back of the deck. At least now I can do a strike double. And, and now I can do a pinky count as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, you're never going to confuse me with one of the world's leading card experts. You put me in a room with uh, Jason Ladani and uh, Darwin Ortiz and you say, how to have a card off? I would be off. I'd be like, right, you two sort yourself out. I'm going to be over there running away, frankly, running away. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, but coins, I can hold my own. Um, or at least I can generally hold my own until Ga Danny Goldsmith's in the same room as me and then I feel very inferior. Um, but, you know, here's the thing. It's just practice. You know, the, the, the more you practice something, you're better that you get at it. I mean, the thing with me is I've always wanted to, you know, I, I, I learn slights for the fun of it. I know lots of moves and lots of slights, but I like to spend a lot of time creating magic. I like to spend a lot of time thinking about why tricks work and how I can try to make them better. I also spend probably as much time thinking about magic as I do thinking about business. I like reading business books and marketing books and books on entrepreneurship entrepreneurialism and how to grow your business and how to level up all this sort of stuff are things that are interesting to me so you know I think to be the next Danny Goldsmith and the best person to ask is Danny Goldsmith but I would say if you're going to be a Danny Goldsmith or a Michael Vincent you're just going to have to just focus on one area I mean Danny is considered the world's leading coin expert he's focused on coins I know he does card tricks but he focuses on coins that's where his abilities lie Michael does some incredible coin magic, but I think that you would agree that his card magic is probably the best thing. Um, so he probably focuses on that. So I think the answer is just, you know, just focus and just, just keep going and just really just video yourself, watch it back, video yourself, watch it back and just constantly improve every single step of the way until you're the best you can be. Okay, so the next question is from the Magic and Mentalism Library. And the Magic and Mentalism Library says, Hi Craig, what are your three favourite Pete Turner tricks? Um, great question. Well, I could pick three, can I? Wow, there's a lot. Um, I would say, in third place, in third place, it's difficult. Okay, so in third place, I would say it would be um, oh, so many to pick. Ah, why do you do this to me? Okay, in third place, I would say his. Should I say that one? I'm sorry, I'm just being really weird, aren't I? Okay, in third place, I was going to say his ACAM, but no. So in third place, I would say on the Stack Watch uh, project that you bought out through Illusionist, he talked about how to get a deck into mnemonica that's been shuffled by the audience. He taught a trick. This is exactly what it is. And I'm not going to go through it because you need to buy the stack watch to learn it. But you shuffle a deck of cards. You have the spectator shuffle, genuinely shuffle deck of cards. You then take the cards back and you do a trick that lasts about three or four minutes that's really engaging and super, super engaging. At the end of that three or four minute procedure, the deck is in stack and you've done this incredible trick. Uh, like this super incredible trick that will blow people away. But at the end of it, the deck's in stack. I've done that so many times to take a shuffled deck and put it into stack. And nobody, not even magicians, realize what I'm doing. And at the end of it, it's just like, well, I've stacked the deck. This is incredible. And I've stacked the deck. So that's the third one. The second one, I would say, is his version of Out of This World, his small packet Out of This World that was in a very, very, very old book from very, very, very long time ago. Um, but he teaches it on a project that him and I are doing together. <gasps> Did I say that out loud? Oh, my gosh. So he's doing a project with me uh, in the not too distant future. And as part of that project, he teaches using the prop that we're using with this project. He teaches his out of this world. Since seeing him do that, I've performed it so many times. And I've had people in tears because of this. It is the best out of this world I've ever seen. Uh, so that's second. And in first, I'd say his impromptu propless star sign divination, which if you haven't seen it, is as close to magic as you're ever going to see. And I remember at the magic podcast meetup at Blackpool on the Wednesday night, he was running around and he was just saying to people, think of your star sign, telling them the star sign, and then think of your date of birth and telling them their date of birth as well. And nothing was written down. It was all existing in their head. It was incredible. 
Um, so I'd say the star sign divination first, the out of this world second and third, uh, his trick that he uses to get the deck into stack from a shuffle deck of cards. Okay, so the next question is from Jonah Berg. And Jonah Berg says, what is the best coin in bottle? Uh, there's a few different versions that I think are really good. Uh, from the top of my memory, the unicorn coin in bottle is brilliant, uh, which is by Nick Einhorn. Uh, and the unicorn coin in bottle is is wonderful for a few different reasons. But you've got this really lovely moment where you put a cork in the bottle and it's just amazing. I'm not going to give it away. But unicorn coin in bottle by Nick Einhorn is really good. Um, I also seem to remember, and I don't know who it was by, I want to say Kevin James, but I might be wrong. Uh, and he had a version of the coin in bottle where it was a Perrier with a twist is what it was called. I'm sure. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. No, that was John Carney, wasn't it? I'm, my mind is fudged, like I said at the beginning. But it's this one where you do the coin in the bottle and then you unscrew the bottom of the bottle, take it off, take the coin out, and then the bottle gets put right back on there again. I'm sure it's Kevin James. Um, but who knows? Uh, also, I love the, uh, the version of coin and bottle that John Bannon put in Impossibilia many, many years ago, which is really good. It's a small bottle. He puts the coin in the bottle, but then he takes a pair of tweezers to pull the coin out. And, you know, it, I'm sure most of you know the, the traditional method for the coin and bottle is using a uh, folding coin. And you, that, the, using tweezers to pull that coin out just looks amazing. Because you grab the coin in the correct place with the tweezers and you pull down and it just looks like it comes out. It's great. Um, so that's really, really good. David Roth's The Funnel is also a really good version where he takes one of those funnels, you know, where you pour drink in and it, it, into a bottle and like that. He puts uh, the funnel into a bottle and he takes three half dollars and as he drops them into the funnel, they shrink down and they land in the bottle tiny. And he just drops all three of them in and they all become tiny as they drop in the bottle. The visual is amazing. And then finally, uh, the Lloyd Barnes coin in bottle. And the only place you can learn that is on the Society of Secrets. Uh, you can't learn it anywhere else, uh, which is his membership platform. And it's one of the best things that Lloyd Barnes has ever showed me. Um, I begged him not to teach it in his lecture. I was like, dude, don't teach that because I kill people with this trick. Uh, it's an imp almost impromptu, pretty much impromptu version of the coin in bottle and uh, the coin just melts through the bottle. It looks amazing. It doesn't use a folding coin. You can borrow the coin. Um, it can be signed if you want it to be. It just looks brilliant. So Lloyd Barnes coin and bottle is exceptional. Okay, so the next question is, what do you, uh, again by Jonah Berg, what do you think of your, uh, what are your thoughts on Showreel by Michael Murray? It's brilliant. It's absolutely amazing. I saw it before everyone else and uh, I loved it, and I love it even more now. I didn't get a chance to pick one up from Michael at Blackpool, but I will be going and getting one in the next week because I want to review it and show everyone this trick. I want to have it in my wallet, and I want to tell people how amazing it is because it is absolutely amazing. Show Real by Michael Murray uh, is one of the best tricks from Blackpool 2023 as far as I'm concerned. It was amazing. So there you go, guys. That's another uh, Q&A in the bag. Do me a favor. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. You want to see more videos like this, like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below. Um, don't forget, I'm going to be back tonight with another video. So there's going to be a, uh, a review show special on three of the tricks that I picked up from JB Magic at Blackpool Magic Convention 2023. So make sure you check that out at nine o'clock tonight. And also, uh, once again, I apologize for not being very well. My brain is really fogged. I'm on antibiotics and I'm going back to bed now. So I apologize if I wasn't as coherent as possible or as, as uh, coherent as I normally am. Thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Don't forget, you want to join the Netrix, just go to www.thenetrix.com. I'll be back again soon. Thanks for watching. My name's Craig from Magic TV. <laughs>